in in the comments section, you will find basically my presentation. Uh, well, the presentation is below the advertisement for my classes. So here, here's the presentation. Uh, so you click on that, and what you'll get is sent to a README file over on GitHub. So the way README files typically work on GitHub is they, they're sort of, mm, the way I like to write them is I like to focus them at kind of a DevOps sort of a personality, someone who's doing a combination of development and operations. So um, hopefully we have some people who are kind of like that tonight. Um, also, I hope to sort of present to what I would call a technical product manager. So if you, if you sort of see yourself as a technical product manager, um, this talk is for you. Also, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will be comprehensive enough so that if you are a beginner at Python, that you would actually find enough in here to um, understand some of it and also gain some motivation. So to that end, what I did is I decided I will create a, a RESTful API that issues predictions on the stock market. That typically gets some interest. People like stock market data. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that stock market data is, uh, it has a lot of randomness to it, and you, many people believe that it is unpredictable. And I'm not sure I want to say if it is predictable or not, but I am willing to say that it is interesting data and it, it, it's useful for learning Python. So that's sort of my angle. Uh, Stephen. Oh, okay. okay, so he has a real good question. And, and the question is, uh, how, what is the duration that you're trying to predict? Is it microsecond, is it year? And for this, particular presentation, the duration is one day. So typically what I do is I get some data from Yahoo and it, its granularity is one day. So I decide to um, create a response variable called percent lead, which is a percentage delta, a price delta over one day. And then I try and predict that using uh, linear regression and uh, regression inside of Keras. No, no. Um, essentially, what I'm using is a, a time series that has two fundamental things in the time series. The first fundamental thing is, is a is a day is a is a date. Okay, so um, I don't get below the date. Okay. Yes, and and the second part of the time series is the closing price. Yeah. So we're only dealing with closing prices. So what that means is when, when I get the data from Yahoo, I ignore open, high, and low, and adjusted close, and also I ignore the volume. So to get started, if, you're, if you want to sort of follow in my footsteps, uh, what I do is I give you the sales pitch that you should be using Ubuntu 16, not because it's you know better than Apple or it's it's better than Windows. It's just so that you can follow in my footsteps. It's it's what I use to develop this and everything should go smoothly for you if you can also get Ubuntu 16 running in your training environment. So in order to help you with that is I, I created this link here. It's a, it's a virtual box um, image or sometimes I call it appliance. So let's click on that and see what it looks like. So when you go to Google, it shows this, and then if you click download, it says, well, this thing is two, it's 10 gig, and we, we, are, we are not scanning it for viruses. So um, uh, I don't think it has any viruses in it. I certainly didn't put any in there. So the, the idea behind this is that um, you would download this to your laptop, uh, and also hopefully your laptop would have VirtualBox running, and then you would see it in your file browser and you would click on it and you would get introduced to what's called an import dialogue and you would import this and then in maybe 10 minutes or so you would have a training environment which is very similar to the training environment which I'll show you tonight. 
Okay, when, when, you, uh, when you do that, you'll see a login screen for an account named Ann. And the password is A. Okay, so let's imagine that I did that. Um, this is what we would see. Oh, let me simulate this. So I'll go here. And we got a the black screen of death. Oh, that's better. I, I was kind of hoping to see the login screen. Oh, so let's go back to Okay, so this is what you would you should see after you import the appliance and you start it. So the password is A. Uh, once in there, um, this looks kind of strange because I'm, I'm running VirtualBox inside of Linux. So what you see are um, two launchers on the left-hand side. So if you're on a Mac, maybe you would be on the bottom. So it looks a little strange running Linux inside of Linux. Um, when, when you log in, you should see something that sort of looks something like this. So what I want you to do is click on Firefox and then bring up this meetup or the GitHub README. Okay, so we'll, let's uh, demonstrate that. So I click on Firefox and it turns out it's already loaded. Um, where it is, is it's on GitHub. And um, it's my name, Dan Bickley. And then the name of the repo is ticker API 20. Let's say you couldn't find that, but what you would do is you go to meetup and you type in, uh, you'd first find it. So I type in Bay Piggies meetup. And here it is. Here we are. And then uh, here is, is essentially the main thing that we'll be wrestling with tonight is this readme file. So we've uh, now simulated getting the training in the VirtualBox training environment. The first thing I'll do is uh, CD to my home folder and I'll clone the repository. Okay, so we'll do that. Uh, by the way, th this might look a little strange to you. I'm running a shell inside of Emacs. Has anyone ever done that? Okay, so it's not a real popular thing, but I kind of like it. Uh, the reason I like it, uh, this is more sort of oriented towards the beginning folks, is when, when I'm doing software development, I'm usually interacting with four types of things. I'm usually interacting with the shell. I'm usually act interacting with files or the, the, the Python files. I'm usually interacting with folders and then the fourth thing I'm usually interacting with is a browser. Okay, three out of those four things I can get to very, very easily inside of Emacs. And we're now looking at one of those things, which is the shell. Uh, somehow it just kind of seems to fit my personality well. It seems to work better than uh, when I watch other people working on their laptops when they bring up maybe 25 terminal windows and then they kind of forget you know, what, where their stuff was, okay? The nice thing about Emacs is it's got this nice finder mechanism in it that allows me to find, you know, any of my 20 shells that I might be working on over the past two weeks. Okay, so here I have a shell called shell. Um, what I'll do is I'll CD to, well, according to, to the readme, what I need to do is do a git clone. Okay, so I could do this, it'll fail because I've already done it. So let's see what happens. If, if you try and run it twice. They'll say, oh, it's already there. Okay, so CD ticker. Uh, so typically, since it's already there, I would do a git pull, see if there's anything new. And it looks like uh, that's good to go. Um, so using Emacs, what I'll do is I'll now go to the readme and I'll spend most of the time with the readme inside of Emacs rather than bouncing back and forth between the shell and the browser. 
So the way we do that is I click on um, uh, this thing in the upper left, and we'll look for the README. And there's the README. So we'll go to the top of the README. And it looks a little different than what we had in the browser because the browser renders it. This is a, a syntax called Markdown. So I'm not very good at Markdown, so you can see my Markdown is kind of simple. So let's start the first demo. I'll CD to my home folder. Okay, CD. Okay, so uh, can anyone tell me about this copy of Python? Has anyone dealt with Anaconda Python? Okay, um, some, why is it good or why is it bad? Batteries included scientific packaging. Yeah, yeah, so I happen to like it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's important to have an opinion, okay? Uh, <laughs> I, I happen to like it. And um, if you want to uh, use my training environment the way I use it, then maybe you'll learn to like it too. Um, so this basically uh, completes the first demo, uh, me bringing up Anaconda Python. Uh, if you'll notice the version of Python that's running, it's fairly recent, it's 3.6.1. And um, so that's that. That completes the first demo. Then the way we, if you're a beginner, the way you get out is you type in quit with parentheses. Okay, so we're out of there. Um, let's take a look at this environment, very, this file full of environment variables. So the way I'll do that is I'll get into Emacs and show it to you. So for this software depends on these environment vari variables. Um, this first one is a um, is part of a mechanism that hooks up my software to Postgres. Okay, so knowing how to connect Python to Postgres, I think, is a good thing to know. And um, the main reason I, I use it in this particular application is. Uh, Building a machine learning model can be expensive, especially a Keras model. So what I like to do is once I, I'd like, I like to capture that work, and there's two ways to capture that work. One is uh, when, I, when I get predictions from it, I can put those predictions in the database and save them and serve them later. Another way to do it is I can create this thing called a Keras model and put it in the database. Okay, and the fact that it's in the database means that um, I can move it from my laptop to some kind of cloud provider like Heroku. Okay, so that's why Postgres, Postgres is in tonight's uh, discussion. Next is a, an environment variable that I call Python, and it just points me over to Anaconda Python. Uh, ParPath is short for parent path. Uh, it basically points to where this application is. Uh, inside the application, I have a Python path where I keep Python scripts, I have a bin path where I keep um, things like shell scripts. Um, then outside of the application, in my home folder, I have a folder set up for intermediate data, and I call that ticker CSV. Uh, and inside of there, I have three folders. One is called div for dividends. Uh, another one is history for price history of each stock ticker that I'll be downloading. And then the third one is split, which is um, uh, a history of split dates for stock tickers. Stephen, did you have a question? Oh, the difference between two and three as far as performance goes? I don't know. Um, I always just, I, when I see two and then I say three, I figure, okay, two is old, three is new. I should probably, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm doing um, like training, I, I don't even want to look at two because I don't have some legacy thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's actually more of like a question for uh, maybe someone at Apple who's using two for legacy systems. I'd... Let's read the hell out of it. There's not really that much of a difference. If you're being the living hell out of it, then you might care. But for most things, you're not going to notice it. Yeah, so I personally like three. Uh, just it's newer. Well, if you use seven the right way, it's like three. So. Yeah. Um, okay, so next I set this environment variable called Flask Debug. The idea behind this is when I bring up a Flask server and I'm doing uh, development, I might change some file that's being used by the server. And if this environment variable is set, then the server will restart itself, and that's very convenient. Uh, next is a, an environment variable called port, and that's used by Flask. So if Flask sees this environment variable, it'll start listening on this port when it comes up. Uh, this environment variable, Keras backend, is used by Keras to point either at TensorFlow or another technology called Theano. And uh, so this one's pointed to TensorFlow, not to say that it's better or worse than Theano. And then, uh, well, we've all seen PATH. Okay, so that's what that file does. Um, on to the next demo. All right now I'm showing 7.33. I, uh, I've gotten until about nine-ish, so hopefully things will go well here. If anyone falls asleep, um, uh, hopefully that won't happen. Next, what I want to do is uh, demonstrate a shell command called Conda. So let's see it, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Uh, can anyone, uh, what does Conda remind you of? PIP, okay, so basically you, uh, if you're using Anaconda instead of vanilla Python, then you will use Conda to install packages. And uh, I will demonstrate the installing of Flask, Keras, NumPy, Pandas, Psycho PG2, and SQL Alchemy. Okay, so uh, apparently it was already installed. Okay, um, next what I'll do is uh, install this, which requires a little bit of a different syntax. It turns out that um, Anaconda has, can anyone describe what Conda Forge is? I, I just assume it's a place where software is sort of served from. Yeah, it's a separate repo. Um, so I guess you have a similar thing in, in the Linux world, like if you're dealing with CentOS, you've kind of got the, the CentOS stuff, and then you've got this other place called EPEL, where they've got other uh, Linux packages. So I think that's kind of what's going on here, similar. So uh, this should basically behave the same. Obviously, when I first tried this, I tried to do a plain Conda install Flask RESTful and it didn't work, so then uh, I went to Stack Overflow and it said that it's inside a Conda Forge. Okay, so we've just finished uh, the second demo. So far, things uh, seem to be going pretty well. Internet's working, the laptop's working. Uh, what you can do is you can list what's in your Conda repository. That's what you'd call it. I, Okay, so this demonstrates how to look for individual things in there. If you want to look at everything, you can just type in Conda list. And um, let's see what's in there. So maybe you see why I like Anaconda. It, getting all of this stuff to install inside of um, a distribution of Python um, can be challenging. So there's this company called Continuum IO, and they've sort of taken on that challenge, and then they deliver all that hard work to me, and I get a copy of Anaconda that has all of this, all of these packages installed without any problems. Uh, has anyone here ever tried to install a package and bumped into problems? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's, I would prefer to turn that over to Continuum IO.
Yeah, so sometimes uh, these different things here, like here's one called um, entry points. Okay, so it's possible that entry points might depend on some Linux library. And if that's the case, then I would need to use apt-get if I'm on Ubuntu to go and get the appropriate stuff. And the way I deal with that is sort of a caveman approach. What I do is I, um, I apt-get install a lot of things. And I'm not sure that um, that's appropriate for production environments, but it's pretty nice for training environments because if it breaks, I just start over. Okay, so that finished, I guess that was the third demo. Let's uh, go on to the next one. So that was a demonstration of Conda. Now let's uh, demonstrate the installation of Postgres. Does anyone here use Postgres at work? Okay, so um, one thing I like about Ubuntu is it is really easy to install Postgres. Uh, if you have a Mac or if you're on CentOS or some of these other platforms, Postgres, I won't say it's hard, it's just sometimes it, it's not nearly as easy as this. So uh, typically the way this works is you, you type in this shell command to uh, go and get some Postgres stuff. Okay, so I already ran it uh, earlier today and so it went very quickly. Next, what I need to do is I need to uh, get connected to uh, the database and that's two command lines. First, I switch user to Postgres. Now I'm Postgres and then I type in PSQL. And uh, so what we're looking at is a, a command line prompt that allows you to type SQL at it. It's not like, um, it won't accept bash. The problem is it kind of looks like a bash prompt. So I, I have made the mistake of typing bash commands at a PSQL prompt and um, I'll probably do it again someday. So if you do that, just kind of be ready. Let's, let's see what happens when you type in LS, nothing. Okay, um, maybe I should type in semicolon now. I hope I didn't break it. Okay, um, I think it's back to normal. Let's uh, type some more SQL commands. What I wanna do is I wanna create uh, two types of things inside of Postgres. I wanna create um, a thing called a database, and then I wanna create um, a user that uh, can connect to the database. But the Postgres people don't call it user anymore, they call it role. Okay, so I'm, we'll call it, we'll use their terminology. Um, my first job out of college, I went to work for, for Oracle. And when, when you, does anyone here work with Oracle software? Uh, maybe two people, okay. So um, in Oracle, the, the word database sort of implies this big giant heavy thing that requires an afternoon to install. In, in Postgres, it's a much more lightweight kind of a thing. It's just sort of like a, a container of tables. That's one way to look at it. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and um, create a database. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so, a role, so a role is different than a user and a role is a more encompassing thing. That's a superset, okay. Okay. So let's create a database. Well, it turns out I had already created it. So uh, Postgres is behaving well here. And let's see what happens when I create this role. Let's, uh, before I create the role, let's look at this, this syntax. So basically, the way this works is this role will get super user privileges, and then its password will be ticker API, which is the same name as the role, and it's also the same name as the database. So it's pretty easy to remember all three of those things because they have the same token. Okay, well, it turns out that also exists. So uh, that's not so bad. I'll type in uh, class Q to get out of Postgres. Now, it turns out I'm still in the Postgres Linux account. I need to get out of that. So I want to go back to the AN account, so I type in exit. And now I'm out of there. And that finishes that demo. 
Uh, now what I want to do is, is talk about sort of three of the main topics of tonight, which is SQL Alchemy, Keras, and Flask RESTful. Um, let's start with SQL Alchemy. I, uh, I wrote a, a script. We can, we can run the script and then we'll kind of take a look at it and, and um, think a little bit about the, the syntax. So what this will do is it'll use Python to interact with the database. The output is not very interesting. Let's, let's look at the script itself. So it's called demo SQL. And it is right here. So I, I, have, I put a lot of comments in here for uh, people who might be new to SQL Alchemy. So for example, they might be curious about where it came from. Uh, I didn't. I looked for it at GitHub and couldn't find it, but I, I did find it at Bitbucket. So maybe um, this person named Zeke here, maybe this person Zeke uh, decided to use Bitbucket instead of GitHub. Uh, next, I talk about how to install Postgres. We already saw that, uh, and how to create uh, a database and a role. Um, then I'm uh, assuming that the, the end user might not have Anaconda installed, so I talk about how to install that. Um, then uh, you need to kind of install SQL Alchemy, which we saw earlier. Then I like to use um, an environment variable called pgurl to point at that database and user that I just created or role. And then here's how I actually run it. Um, so this is talking to Postgres on my laptop. We might want to talk to Postgres out on the cloud. Uh, I would like to talk to Postgres it doesn't cost any money, okay? So, and it turns out there is such a Postgres at Heroku. So I'll show you how to, uh, to get to that one. So the first thing I need to do is um, install the Heroku client. So let's see if the Heroku client is installed. And the way you check is you type in which Heroku. Okay, so it looks like it is installed in this training environment. If if you, if you want to know how to install it, you just go to Google and you ask how to install the Heroku client. One thing that's a little bit frustrating about that is um, the instructions seem to change about once a year. So um, be ready for that. So I, I have the Heroku client installed. Um, now what I'll, it's telling me to um, do th these um, uh, shell commands here. I think what I'll do instead is, is follow the shell commands in the readme rather than the shell commands in this, in this comment section. I did test these in the, in the comment section and they worked pretty well, but I don't want to like go down two paths at the same time. So let's go back to the readme. Okay, has anyone here worked with Heroku technology? Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so basically what's going on here is it's creating uh, two things at once. It's creating a repository and it's creating this Heroku application thing, okay? Now, it, it turns out that uh, if you notice, I tried to create it, and it says, oh, it's already been created, okay? So uh, let's figure out, how, figure out how to destroy it. And the way you do that is you uh, do Oroku apps destroy I think that'll do it. Okay, so it's done. Now I can create it, because I just destroyed it. Okay, so uh, we're making good progress here. I've created that thing. Now what I want to do is I want to tell Heroku that I want to 
use the uh, the free Postgres. So that is a number of steps, and here's the first one. Okay, so it gives me some information, but it looks like it worked. And then I need to get the top secret mm, token thing. The way you do that is with this. So th this, try not to memorize this URL because it's top secret. Um, so what I do is I use it to um, connect my Python software, which is running on my laptop, to the Postgres database over in, I guess, probably in San Francisco. Okay, so the first thing I'll do is I'll grab some syntax like this. And I'll grab this guy. Okay, so now um, this should be talking to Postgres in San Francisco rather than Postgres on my laptop. Hopefully it'll work. Okay, it seemed to work. Um, let's, let's connect to Postgres using uh, the Postgres command line interface. And the way you do that is you type in uh, Heroku uh, PG PSQL, I think. Ooh, okay, uh, so far so good. And um, so uh, how do I see what tables I have? I guess I do a slash D. Yeah, I have a table called drop me. So let's uh, see what's inside of drop me. Select, okay, so here's your SQL education. There is your first SQL statement for today, or, or for some of you. Okay, so it looks like uh, my my data that was on my laptop did make it into the Postgres database in San Francisco. So this is this is kind of an important step, and the reason why is it shows that um, I can I can do some heavy lifting with um, an office full of laptops and do things like create um, expensive machine learning models. Okay, and then once I have them, I can put them in a database over in San Francisco and then I can serve them. And that's a lot cheaper than um, building the models in San Francisco. Okay, so that finishes that demo. Um, one thing I wanted to do is, is take a look at demo sql.py a little bit more using the debugger. So let's try that. Oh, if you're new to Python, um, the way you start the debugger is you type in Python M PDB and then the name of the script that you want to walk through. And uh, you'll get a, a PDB prompt like what we see here. And it's Basically, now I can walk through it line by line by line. So when I'm in class, I, I usually ask the students, well, what should I type in first? And the answer is help. Okay, so let's type in help. So these are all of the debugger. Are people here familiar with the debugger or is this new? Okay, so we've got one person who knows the debugger. It has a friend called RP. Oh, RT. R, R, okay. you, you put set trace in your code? Yes. When it hits, it opens a port. And Oh, cool. Okay, um, I, I got to learn that. Um, right now, I'm still kind of dealing with, you know, um, caveman PDB, and um, so here are my favorite commands. I like L for list. That that kind of tells me. If you notice on the left hand side near the bottom, there's a red arrow. Okay, that's telling me where I am right now. Uh, my next favorite command, aside from list and help, is next. But I don't have to type in next, I can just type in N. So let's just keep typing in N. And uh, what it will do is it'll step through the code. So we can see uh, here, I'm, I'm uh, creating a string called db underscore s from that PG URL, which we were using to connect to San Francisco. So if I want to see what that looks like, See if it's got any secret information in it. I just type in the name of the variable, and um, that's what it is. 
Okay. Um, next, uh, which should be of interest in this meetup since we're talking about SQL Alchemy, is this command here called um, create engine. So basically what this does is it creates a connection to Postgres using this string. And so now my Python is connected to this Postgres database. And once I'm connected, then I can start sending uh, SQL commands to it. So here's the first SQL command. Uh, I'm about to execute it. Let's see what it is actually. So it's gonna drop table of exist, drop me. So I'll do that. And then I'll create it again. Okay, now um, we've got this interesting mechanism inside of SQL Alchemy where you have percent %s, percent %s. So what you, what you quickly learn with um, SQL Alchemy uh, pretty quick is you, you bump into statements where you need to feed in parameters. And this is a mechanism to, to feed in parameters is this percent %s. So these are like placeholders which will get filled in later. Stephen, you had a question? Um, oh, the, the, mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. Yeah, this has username, password, and database. And then it's also got a host in there and a port. Yeah, you, the URL part is the EC254197 part. Yeah, so if anyone can remember this, I mean, you could connect to it too using your, your iPhone. If, you know, if you've got SQL Alchemy on your iPhone. Okay, so the intent here is I've got a couple of tokens that I want to, or parameters that I want to feed into this insert statement. and. Basically, I'm gonna insert in a name and a rank, okay? So a name will be a string and rank will be an integer. Okay, so let's see how that's done. Uh, so basically, notice that I have a list here, a Python list that's got a string and an integer, and it needs to match up with uh, these percent S's here. So I notice I have two percent S's, and, and then I have two tokens inside this list. And, um, so this is the proper way to do it. You'll see some code later tonight where I show you the wrong way to do it, where basically what I do is I, I concatenate together this giant SQL string and then just feed it. Uh, that's way bad because it opens you up to a, a security problem called SQL injection. Has anyone ever issued SQL injection against the website? No, no, okay, we're not getting any uh, confessors here, okay. <laughs> So um, I'll just keep trucking along here. And so um, what this does is the SQL S does not change. What does change is, is the statement. So, so I can keep issuing these statements to insert rows. Okay, now I, I use the same idea again. Notice I have, a, this is the next SQL statement. Uh, what I want to do is feed in a parameter to um, help with the select. And uh, what I'll do is select name and rank from drop me where rank is greater than two. And then I'll print it out. Oh, so here's the next thing is um, notice here, I've got result equals con dot execute. In the other ones, I didn't have that. The, the other ones, I just had plain ordinary con dot execute by itself. But here, I actually collect the output, okay? And what I wanna be able to get the data out of that object called result. And the way I do that is with, um, I kind of treat it like a list. So I use the syntax for row and result. And um, the row is kind of like a dictionary. So the way I get to things in it is I can use row.name, for example and it will um, show me what's in there. So there, there's the, the uh, first name.
Okay, so that demonstrates that. Um, next, what we want to do is uh, I'll show you. How, so we've demonstrated how to do an insert and a select, and we've also demonstrated this idea of parameters in the SQL statement with the percent %s and the list in the execute. Now, what I want to do is demonstrate update. Well, update is similar. Uh, we've got percent %s's in here, so there's going to be an execute with a corresponding list later. So what this should do is it should update drop me and set rank equal to um, rank plus one, where rank is greater than two. Okay, and then we'll check our work. Okay, and then um, we'll do a delete statement. And now what I'll do, so, um, so we'll see it in real time now. Hopefully I'm still connected to my database in San Francisco. So this is kind of what it looks like. So um, hopefully now you kind of understand a little bit better about how SQL Alchemy works. I, I like. There's some other things I can do where I can sort of play this game of creating these Python type classes that are um, allow me to operate on uh, rows such that they're kind of like oh, objects in Python world. And I tend to not go there. I'm, you know, I used to work at Oracle, so I like SQL commands. And this sort of fits my style pretty well. Okay, um, moving along. That was. Um, the SQL Alchemy demo. Now let's um, switch gears and talk about, oh, I need to, before I switch gears, I need to make sure I'm not pointed at San Francisco anymore. Okay, so now I want to demonstrate um, Keras. So what I'll do is I'll just I'll run the script and then we'll walk through it with the debugger and talk about the syntax. So right off the bat, it tells me that it's using TensorFlow. And I, I like, while we're waiting for this, I'll tell you why I like Keras. I, I first started uh, with TensorFlow by going through the TensorFlow tutorials. And um, they weren't that hard, but once I bumped into Keras, it just seemed much, much sweeter. It's sort of like um, my experience when I first bumped into Vagrant. I, um, has anyone here worked with Vagrant? Yeah, basically Vagrant is sort of like this sweet layer on top of VirtualBox. And once I saw it, I said, oh, I like that better. So Keras kind of reminds me of that a little bit. It might not be as flexible or powerful as TensorFlow, but it, it does have uh, some really sweet behavior. Okay, so um, looks like the script did not blow up, so that's a good sign. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about loss. Um, typically when I talk about loss in my machine learning class, what I do is I get up in front of the whiteboard and I draw a scatter plot. Okay, and then I ask the students, what should I do with the scatter plot? And someone says, you should fit a line. I say, okay, so I, I draw a line below the scatter plot where it doesn't go any through any dots at all. And I say, is that a good fit? And they, and they say, no, it's not. It doesn't fit the line at all. And then I bring in the concept of what is loss. And I say that um, if the line fit, then the loss of information that it has 
would be minimum. On the other hand, this, this line that I drew underneath the scatter, scatter plot that doesn't touch any dots, it loses a lot of information. Its loss is high. So that's how I describe what loss is. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a concept which basically means loss of information. And if the line fits, that means it's, it's the loss of information is a minimum. If the line doesn't fit, then loss is high. So then I take that concept and I say, okay, after you understand fitting a line through a scatter plot, then uh, you can sort of generalize that concept and say that uh, a model is kind of like a line and it can have loss too. It can either have, uh, it can either lose a lot of information or it can not lose a lot of information. And if it, uh, if it loses a lot of information about the thing that it's trying to, to model, then the loss is high. And that's what, so when you see this word loss here on the screen, that's, you should think about that, what I just described when you look at the word loss. We're not losing money. Stephen. Oh yeah, we're gonna take a look at the code. Um, so let's take a look at the code that uh, ran this thing. Okay, so uh, the code is uh, demo keras.py, so let's take a look at that. So this is what it looks like. I start off with some comments saying you should set your environment. Um, I need to import Keras and um, some other things. Then what I do is I create some X variables that are about as simple as I could think of. Okay, so essentially what I've got is um, a, a two dimensional matrix where um, uh, the first row everything goes up and the second row everything goes up. And what I want to do is match it to a, I kind of visualize it as a Y row vector that is very much correlated with these. So um, if you look at this with your human brain, you could see that uh, when X goes up, Y tends to go up, they're correlated. So the, the Keras model that, that I build should see the same thing. Okay, so um, I have these, this training data, this five rows of training data, and the first thing I do is, um, uh, you know, I go to Google and I say, well, how do I create a Keras model? And what it does is it shows me, basically it sends me here, okay? Uh, so here's the first line of Keras syntax for tonight is Keras models dot sequential. So if you if you read the Keras documentation, they talk about kind of like two different ways to build these models. One way is you can kind of start with this and then issue a series of add commands. And so you'll see that I have some add commands down below. Or what you can do is you can kind of create it all in one API call. Um, I prefer the add commands because um, if something breaks while I'm adding, I kind of I kind of know. On the other hand, if I'm trying to create a model like all in one giant, super long API call, uh, if there's a problem in there, it, it might be harder to find. Okay, so th that's why I do it this way. Um, so the first thing I need to do is, is figure out um, what, how to create what's called an input layer. Okay. Well, looking at the data, we can see that um, basically what will be coming in are two inputs, okay? So the inputs correspond to the columns in this, in this X data. So I'm gonna have two inputs. And uh, so that'll go into the input layer and then the input layer will also have outputs, okay? And this syntax sort of sets all of that up. Uh, now what I do is I go to the next layer, and the way I do that is I, is I call this function called add, and uh, typically what I add next is activation, okay? Um, it turns out you have some, some choices for activations. Um, I chose linear because it seemed like the simplest for this meetup. Uh, one that seems real popular is called ReLU, uh, you can read up on that, and then there's um, there's some other ones. I just picked linear. Um, maybe if you go to like a real machine learning class, he'll talk about like you know what are good activations to use uh, after the input layer. Okay, so we've got the input layer done. Okay, 
Now we're going to go to the next layer. And uh, basically what I need to do is say how many neurons are in it. And I do that with this API call. And this will only have one uh, neuron coming out or one neuron with, which has a linear activation. Okay, uh, so this is a simple two layer neural network. So do you use dense twice? You the previous thing, you passed in the length of the number of things you had. So why is that previous time a larger number of times? Um, each, it's my understanding that, that uh, essentially what dense does is it specifies how many neurons are in each, are in each layer. Is that a correct assumption? Okay. Well, how many layers do I have? Two. How many calls to dense do I have? Two. So I think that's how, um, does that answer the question, do you think? So, oh, it's, so just by practice, the last layer is your output layer. Yeah, okay. Why is dense is one? Why is dense? Why is it hard? Oh, because um, I'm doing, uh, basically I'm doing regression. So if, if you're creating a model that's going to classify, say, three flowers, then I would have three outputs. And typically what you would do is each output would be corresponded to some kind of probability that it's flower number one, two, or three. On the other hand, if you're doing regression where I just want one number that's coming out, then I only need, I only want one neuron on the last layer. And um, then what I chose to do with this one neuron is have it output a, a linear activation. Okay. Uh, that, that would be kind of advanced. Typ typ typically what I do is when, when I uh, predict stocks, I do it one at a time. And I just get predictions for that one stock inside of some for loop. And then once, you know, I'm done with that, then you know, I, I, I start over. Okay. No, I, I, but I don't know. Maybe um, I don't understand. Sounds like it might be a cool idea. Yeah, so uh, the question is, um, I'm not sure what the question is, but it's, it's I, I mean, I, I respect Stephen a lot, but um, I'm not as smart as he is. Oh, okay, yeah, so he's saying, okay, you've, you've got in things that you want to predict. Why not have in outputs on in one network? If I, yeah. yeah, and to me that sounds like it'd be a good idea. The way I did it is instead of having n outputs, uh, basically I had n networks. And he's asking you why. <laughs> and the answer is um, seemed obvious to me. I mean, um, That's gonna be something yeah. Could be. Yeah, we'll take it offline. Okay. So here we are, we're wrestling in the mud with this uh, Keras syntax. Um, after I create the model, okay, this two layer model, what I need to do is um, make a call to compile. And essentially what I do is I, I talk about, I need to tell it what kind of loss function I'm using, okay? Um, now you can go to machine learning class and they'll, they'll teach you what a loss function is, or you can just kind of take the caveman approach and that is that there are different ones and different ones are appropriate for what you're trying to do. What I'm trying to do is very similar to linear regression. Okay, so if you go to machine learning class and learn about linear regression, what you learn is that the, the loss function that you want to use is called mean squared error. Okay, so when I saw that in the API documentation, I said, I want that one because I'm, what I'm doing is very similar to linear regression. Um, oh, yeah. Um, it, yeah, okay. yeah, you know, 
He's got a good point. Um, mean squared error might go a little faster since you're not doing the square root, but um, he says it's the same thing. Okay. Uh, next, what I want to do is uh, pick an optimizer. Okay, so uh, basically the way you answer this is you go to Google and you type in what is the best optimizer in Silicon Valley today, okay? And, and they'll tell you, oh, it's not stochastic gradient descent, it's this thing called Atom, okay? And then you'll go to Andre Karpathy's webpage and he'll have like this nice visualization of the Atom optimizer that just like goes to the minimum in about half of a second. Meanwhile, stochastic gradient descent is like wandering around in Nebraska and then eventually it gets there, okay? So I said, I want Atom. So that's why I picked Atom. Now that might sound a little caveman-ish, but um, that's how I did it. Okay, next, we have to fit, okay? And fit takes two sort of important uh, parameters, batch size and epochs, okay? So epochs, usually I set to a power of two, and here I set it to 128. Uh, and then batch size um, corresponds to how many rows in my training set I will sort of batch together when I'm when I'm optimizing. Okay, so I figured four was, would be good. I only have five rows. Uh, one interesting thing to try is to try five rows, and it turns out it doesn't work very well, and I haven't figured out why that is. Okay. Uh, how many CPUs do I have? I have an i7, but this is running in VirtualBox, so may, uh, yeah, um, Oh, let's take a look. S1. Looks like I have two. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so maybe maybe that's it. I don't know. Uh, eventually what I do is I get a prediction, and the way I collect the predictions is they, they end up in this thing that outputs a... NumPy array. Notice, though, that I need to feed it some test data. And uh, if you look closely at the, at the, the training data, uh, basically you can see it's sort of monotonically increasing along with the Y values. So if I give it um, a test value of, say, 2.5, 3.5, then, um, you know, I should get something in between here. Okay, so let's see what I did. So this is what I fed it, and um, what, it, what should come out is about 2.5, just based on the neural network in my head. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. Uh, it seemed to work pretty well. Now what I want to do is sort of wander into what I think is a really, really nice feature of Keras, and that is the ability to um, save a model. So let's see how that's done. It's done with this syntax here. So um, the idea here is that I would save this, okay, and then I would somehow get it into my Postgres database, okay, and that database could be in San Francisco, and then what I could do is serve that model out from San Francisco, and I don't need to buy a bunch of or ran a bunch of hardware up there to create my models. What I could do is I could use these old laptops that I have sitting around in my office to create the models and then send them to San Francisco where they're served out. Um, so that's sort of the intent. And this is a step in that direction. So let's see if, in fact, there's a file there. So let's look at it with Emacs. Yeah, so Emacs is pretty good at, at looking at binary files. Um, so this is what that looks like, an H5 file. Okay, so I saved the file, um, and then what I do is um, uh, I start to interact with, with the with the database, so that um, the model goes into it, and this is basically the syntax that I use to get that model into the database, and. Obviously, then I would want to be able to take the, the model out of the database and then use it. And uh, that's what this syntax does here. One thing that probably I should do to refactor this is I have this intermediate file uh, to collect it. And um, 
I tried to tinker around with the I.O. package to make it so that the moving the file out of the database, I didn't have to go to an intermediate file. I could just kind of stuff it into some kind of I.O. memory structure and then use that to create the model. I haven't figured that out yet. So until I figure that out, basically what I do is I just put it in this file here. And uh, once it's in that file, then I can create a new model much, much faster than uh, the training that I had to do to create the model in the first place. And then uh, once I have that new model, I can use it to create predictions. Okay, so that's demo Keras. Okay, so we saw a demonstration of, of Keras and before this, a demonstration of SQL Alchemy. The third piece that I wanna show you is Flask RESTful. Okay, so let's take a look at the code behind that. Okay, so um, basically here's some documentation URLs that you can look at. Um, the idea is when you run Flask RESTful, you wanna basically use two shells to interact with it. The first shell, um, you, you run these commands and it brings up the server and then it's listening on port 5050, okay? And it's important that I leave that shell alone. I don't control C it or, or kill it. Then I go and get a second shell and um, I use it to issue curl commands at the server that's running in the first shell and then I should, stuff should come out. So it's a pretty simple demo. Uh, here's the Python syntax to set all of this up. First, I need to import Flask then Flask RESTful. Um, then I use OS to get the port. And this is sort of a uh, hello world app for Flask, Flask RESTful. Um, one thing that you'll learn about um, uh, these types of servers is you, you'll have one URL and the server will behave differently depending on how do you talk to that URL with the HTTP verb. So what this syntax does is it has one um, sort of URL endpoint called hello JSON, but it has two modes of behavior. The first mode is if it sees a get, then it will return this. If on the other hand, it sees a post, it will return that. Okay, so let's see a demonstration of that. Okay, here's a drum roll. Okay, so this is, I'll call this shell one. So this shell is locked, I can't use it anymore. So now we'll create a second shell. We'll call it shell two. Okay, so there's shell two. And then what I wanna do is uh, hit this thing with a, a curl command. So the way I do that is I type in curl And then I have to give it the right um, uh, URL. So I'm, I got a little bit of a clue over here. So I'll, I'll use this. So that'll be uh, local host 5050. Now, if I just did this, it will, it'll, it'll give me a 404 error because it's not linked up to respond to nothing. Okay, so I'll, get, I'll demonstrate that. It'll just say, you know, there's nothing there. So I have to go to the readme and figure out well, what, what is it actually looking for. And what it's looking for is this. So this is, will send a get. Okay, so that it, the flash server returns a hello world to the get. And now let's send a post. 
So the interview question is, in curl, how do you send a post? And the answer is you use dash D with a string with an equal sign. Okay, so let's uh, look at the code real quick to see if this output makes sense. Okay, so the, the first thing here, we have hello world. Well, that's coming from this get. And then we have this syntax here, this JSON, and it's coming from this, from this post. Um, one subtle thing to keep in mind is the, the, the syntax on the right is JSON. The syntax on the left is Python. So there's this sort of mechanism where um, Flask RESTful is converting Python dictionaries into JSON. Okay, they look similar, but they're actually different. Okay, um, oh my gosh, it's 822. Um, okay, I'll try and hurry it up. Go to, um, pick up the pace. So here I get to go into a dis discussion about the verbs. <laughs> okay, uh, next what I wanna do is talk about, um, so we basically talked about three things, Flask RESTful, uh, Keras, and SQL Alchemy. What I wanna do is bring them together into an application that's dealing with the stock market. So in order to do that, I need to go get some stock market data, okay? And um, this script does that, so let's take a look at it. Okay, so this is a shell script. Uh, this is the uh, Python meetup, not the shell script meetup, so we'll kind of gloss over this real quick. And we'll take a look at the Python that's um, sort of at the guts of what's going on here. So um, back in April, you could go to Yahoo and get prices and they would just, you know, you could fire up a curl command and they would just give you all the prices you could eat. And then something happened in May where they kind of turned that off and um, a lot of people in, in the internet just were just like, where did it go? So what I had to figure out was, well, are the prices still there? And it turns out, yeah, they're still there. Um, what I need to do is I need to go in through a browser and look at advertising and then click on the right things and then I can get the prices. Um, now I got to thinking, well, maybe, maybe Python could read or look at the advertising and, and then, then I could get the CSV file. Okay. So, um, so let's, let's take a look at kind of how that works. Um, I'll show you the data that I want to get. So we'll go here. We'll go to the wonderful world of uh, finance. Uh, yahoo.com. Okay, does anyone here have a favorite ticker? Well, it used to be LinkedIn, but now it's Microsoft, right? So we'll take a look. <laughs> Tesla, okay, let's try Tesla. Okay, so here's Tesla. And I'm looking at this page, and what, I, what I'm interested in is not the advertising, but this little link here called historical data. So watch what happens when I click historical data. Watch uh, this part up here. Okay, it changed a little bit. I got a token here called history. Okay, now what I can do is I can actually download stuff by clicking this link here. And if we look at this, let's take a look at this link. I'll copy it, I'll load it into uh, the field. Well, that link is longer than my arm. Um, so what's interesting about this link is it's, okay, we see Tesla is in there. Then we've got this parameter called period one. Okay, I look at this. Now it looks like some kind of Unix date. And I look at this. That looks, is, can you, is that big enough? You can just barely read it, huh? Okay, that looks like a Unix date. Okay, so far so good. What's interesting is this guy right here, the crumb. Okay, it turns out when, if you hit this with different browsers, the crumb changes, okay? 
And so that's the first thing I noticed. The second thing I noticed is that um, uh, if I were to take this and put it in another browser, it won't work. Well, first let's see if it works in this browser. So yeah, it worked. It, it wants to give me a CSV file, so that's good. But well, let's put it in another browser. I have another browser here. I've only got two CPUs, okay. Um, and Yahoo will say, talk to the hand. Uh, invalid cookie, unauthorized, okay. So um, I suspect what's going on here is this is some um, mechanism that's been set up to generate revenue, maybe, I, I don't know. Um, so my goal is to figure out how to uh, get these CSV files. Okay, um, lost my train of thought. I'll get it back. Oh, okay, so anyway, here's the magical Python syntax which does this. First, I have to, to wrap this thing in the shell script, which um, is feeding it uh, different tickers on the command line. So let's take a look at the tickers. Okay, so we've got... 728 tickers that I want to get from Yahoo. So this this uh, while loop inside this bash script will will run 728 times, and it will run this Python here. Let's take a look at this Python here. So anyway, I start off with some comments and I say, well, here's how you run this thing if you want to get just one ticker. Well, let's see if that works. I hope it works. I, I hate it when I, when my, my software doesn't work on this thing. Show you the what? Oh, yeah, on on the on the left side. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, well, first, I, before I show you the stuff on the left, I want to let's see if in fact we got the data. Okay. Uh, and I'm mostly interested in this one here. This is where the prices are. Oh, I see prices. So it worked. Okay. So let's. Um, so you saw a demonstration of, of using this to get one ticker. Okay. Um, yes. This is IBM. I understand that. You're you're repeatedly asking it for the entire history of IBM data. Um, yeah. I mean, this is machine learning. I need, and I need as many years as I can get. Um, okay, yeah, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> so you, you might be wondering why they're showing the ads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so um, back to uh, the syntax. So uh, where do I start? Um, so basically what's going on with this script is, it's, is it, it hits Yahoo twice. And then it creates this big, giant, long URL with a crumb on the end of it, and it sends that. And then most of the time, I'll get a CSV file back. Okay, and that's kind of what's going on here. Um, uh, one thing that I don't know, um, I need to tell it that I'm Mozilla 50x11 Apple WebKit Chrome 5900 Safari. So this is uh, what's called a user agent string. Um, so it thinks that I'm a browser. Um, and then here's part of the URL where I give it the, the Unix date. 
And then um, this syntax here, oh, by the way, this, this all ro revolves around a package in Python called requests. Has anyone used requests at work? Yeah, requests is kind of popular. Um, so this particular request syntax here, what, basically what it does is it um, handles this thing called the session cookie. Okay, so what's going on is Yahoo is sending me a session cookie, which it puts in my cookie store locally, and then embedded it within the HTML is this thing called a crumb. And when I come back later, I need to kind of supply both at the same time in order to get my CSV. And um, so I use this syntax here to deal with the cookie. Uh, to get the crumb, I need to rely on a regular expression. So let's, here's a bunch of uh, commentary on how I talk about how I first used sed and curl to get the crumb. And then I said, you know, a Python's better instead what I should use is a regular expression. Okay, so basically um, uh, this is a demonstration of how to use a regular expression to get a Chrome out of an HTML page which is larger than this room. Um, okay, next what I do is I issue a series of GET requests and uh, eventually what comes back are, are a bunch of CSV files. So I ran this at home, let's go take a look at them. So the, the, I get three types. I get dividends. Um, right now I'm just using history, but I think dividends and split dates, um, if I'm uh, clever, I might be able to pull those into my machine learning model somehow. There might be some predictive power within the dividends and the split dates. Right now I'm basically using just two types of information. I'm using the prices and I'm using the dates. Okay, so let's see what's in the history. So, um, looks like I might have 700 CSV files here. Uh, let's see if I've got Microsoft. Where's Microsoft? There it is. So it's uh, about half a, half a meg. So it starts in 1986, and let's see, it's got uh, up to yesterday. Okay. So um, we got data. Let's go back to the README. So if you know Markdown, uh, this line here says get data. Uh, let's see what it looks like here. Okay, so we're now at this point here. So we ran the script. We kind of took a look at some of the magical Python syntax. Uh, this is what it looks like when I, when I run it on my laptop. Um, when I run it, it takes five to six hours to finish. Okay, um, and then once it's done, um, most of what I get ends up in a folder called history, 255 meg. Um, if I want, so that's how I operate this if I want to go and get 728 tickers. I might, however, just want to get like a top 10. So for that, what I could do is I could use this file instead. Okay, so I'll show you how to do that. So this is the big file. Let's take a look at the small file. It was uh, ticker list underscore small. And let's see if it runs.
Well, it's not complaining. Okay, so we'll, we'll kind of put that on the back burner, let it run for a while. Let's go back to the README while that's running. Okay, so we're getting data. And uh, this is what it looks like when I get it. And here in, in the readme, I get into sort of this discussion of, of how that Python script is working and kind of issues that I bumped into while developing it. Um, next, what I want to do is take all of the CSV data and put it into Postgres. Okay, so um, there's a number of ways I could do this. One way is... Um, each row inside the CSV could sort of map to a row in a table. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to um, have a row for each ticker and then have a column for that row which contains the entire CSV. Okay, and I decided to go that way. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at um, the script which kind of helps me do that. It's called CSV to db.py. Uh, okay, so the question is why stuff it in the database? Um, this is a really good question, and it's sort of um, one of the key themes about this meetup. And that is that um, I have this service that I want to deploy. Okay, and I, um, I want to deploy it on Heroku, for example. I like Heroku because it's free. Um, <clears throat> so one way I could do this is I could take all of the CSV data and put it into a Git repository and then push it to Heroku. Okay, and that, that will work. Okay, uh, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, so I'm slowly getting there. Okay, the problem is if, if I if I use Git to push all my data up to Heroku, um, I'll, I'm constantly updating the Git repository with data, and in my opinion, a Git repository is not should not be holding data; it should be holding software, so that uh, when the software changes, that shows up in the Git repository. But then, oh. Well, Heroku has a Postgres database. What I should do is I should separate the data from the software, put all of the data in the Postgres database, and then um, my world would be good. Okay. Um, does that kind of answer your question? I'm asking why you're stuffing all the CSVs in one building space. Why not? Oh, okay. Um, two two reasons. Yeah, two reasons. Uh, the first reason is, is um, if I have a ticker, I want to be able to quickly go and get the CSV for that ticker. Okay. Uh, the second reason is if, if you want to use a free database up at Heroku, they cut you off after 10,000 rows. So if I have 700 tickers, what I can do is I can stuff a lot of data into each row. And then if I need to get access to a pandas data frame, what I... He wonders why there's ads. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's sort of um, the long-winded answer. Yes. Yeah, and if I want to get it into pandas, typically what I'll do is I'll use SQL Alchemy to go look up a ticker, get the corresponding CSV load that into a pandas data frame with uh, read CSV, and then I've got pandas. Okay. Um, right. Yes. Once again, he's using the free service with all of his massive amounts of data. 
But um, look at the alternative. If, I, if I'm going to have the, the CSV uh, updated with just a little bit and it's going into a Git repository, then what happens is Git starts to balloon. I don't understand your point. You're storing way too much data for the amount of work you're doing. Uh, that's not true. Um, basically, um, there's a scenario where you might want to say, okay, Dan has this mechanism to predict the stock market. So the obvious question might be, okay, well, how did it work in 1995? How did it work in 1982? How did it work in 2006? So basically, what you want to do is create a mechanism so you can report on the effectiveness of this mechanism going back as far as you can and see, and then what you do is you answer questions like, what, what are the most predictable tickers? What is an optimal amount of data to learn from? Uh, what are the best features? Okay, so um, what this does is this uh, is an example of how to uh, take the CSV data, loop through it, and put it into a Postgres database. And it uh, looks like this finished on, on the left. Um, let's see if how this works. Worked earlier today. So this is a shell script, which um, I'll show it to you. Uh, what it does is it uh, looks for problem CSV files that I got from Yahoo, and it removes them if um, they contain the word cookie. So um, it looks like it found two. It found Apple and uh, JPM. So if I run it again, it should. Okay, so that's done. Um, and I might want, if I had time, what I would do is I would go and get that data again. So what this does is this Python script goes and looks inside of each CSV file and attaches it to a ticker, and then takes all of that data and puts it into a, a row in a, in a table. So while that's running, it, that usually takes like a minute. Let's see if we can figure out which table it's going into. Yellow if you see a table name. Oh, I see it. Ticker prices. Now, one thing I should point out is this syntax is sort of an example of uh, do what I say, don't do what I do. Okay, um, what, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm embedding strings here full of data. And really what I should use is the, the previous syntax that we saw before where I had the percent %s, and then I would put a list to the right-hand side of the, the execute command. Okay, so that finished. Uh, let's go back to the readme. Okay, next what we want to do is uh, generate features. Um, so when I got started in, in uh, machine learning the stock market, I kind of poked around different finance sites and tried to figure out how is it that people are making decisions? How do, how do they make their predictions with their gray matter? And what I found was a discussion about 
uh, these things called candlesticks, trend lines, and then some people would use uh, what, are, what I call calendar features. For example, some people are shy about buying in the summer, um, and they tend to be a little bit more bullish when October comes around, and sometimes people are more bullish on Monday than, say, Friday. Okay, so I saw those two things, and I thought, okay, well, maybe those are features that uh, I should be using. And um, that's sort of um, the, the thinking that goes behind the next script that I'll show you. Uh, this is sort of what I would call the, the product manager version of what's going on. I decided that I want to have these, what I call four lag features. Okay, so the first one is basically um, how much the price changed over the pre previous day in percentage terms. Some people think that if, if the stock market goes down a lot in one day, then that's sort of a bullish signal for the next day. So that's sort of the thinking behind this. And I, and I thought, well, why just stop at one day? Maybe what I should have instead is like two days, and then I did it by factors of, of two. I did one day, two days, four days, and eight days. Uh, another thing that's somewhat similar is what I call slope of the moving average. So what I'll do is I'll create a, uh, say a six day moving average of the price and then I'll calculate the slope. Um, both of these lag features, uh, both of these features lag and slope are really easy to do with pandas. So um, that's why I have them. Uh, then the next two are what I call calendar features. and the, my favorite two calendar features are day of the week and month of the year. Okay, so the script which creates these is called genf.py. And I'll show you the uh, pandas syntax that I use to create the lags. It kind of looks like this. Uh, essentially what we're doing is we're making a call to a, a pandas method called shift, okay? Um, another pandas method that I like is called roll X, or it's actually called rolling. And um, it's very similar to um, what the SQL people call a window function. Has anyone here written window functions in SQL? Okay, yeah, so this is like window functions. So the archetypical window function in SQL is a moving average. The archetypical um, rolling method inside of pandas would probably be a rolling mean. So this is the syntax that I use to create those features. Um, and then once, once I create the features, what I do is I uh, stuff them into a database table called features. Let's run this and see how it works. Okay, while we're waiting on that, let's, let's take a look at some uh, syntax inside of here. Um, so the first thing I, what I wanna do is um, get data out of ticker prices, which is a table inside of Postgres. So this is the syntax which does that. And what I need to do is um, um, pull it out into a data frame and this is how basically I copy the, the CSV file out of Postgres into uh, a pandas data frame called feet.df. Now once I have that data inside of feet.df, then I can run these various uh, feature calculations. Uh, what else can I show you? Well, once it's all done, once everything is all sort of calculated, then I wanna put it back into the database. And um, again, the way I do that is I use this insert statement here. And then if I wanna check on it, one thing I can do is this.
Looks like I got eight minutes. Um, so uh, since I got eight minutes, um, maybe what I should do is, is kind of do what I do in my classes. A lot of times in my classes, what I'll do is I'll create a presentation and the presentation will be like, I, I won't know how long it will be. It'll be like, you know, a five hour presentation and the class will only be like an hour and a half. So uh, typically what I'll do is I say, okay, you've seen enough of the presentation that you should now be able to go home and do the homework, right? And, and about, you know, the people who aren't looking at their cell phone or, you know, sleeping, um, some of them will nod their head and say yes, okay? Um, so the idea here is you've seen the README and you've kind of seen me interact with it for more than an hour. Um, it's my hope that some of you um, who are developers, beginning Python people and DevOps people, and possibly uh, technical product managers could set up this training environment, which basically means you, you down, download the 10 gig virtual box, you log in as Ann, and then you just start uh, walking through the README and you should be able to get this stuff working, okay? And what you'll see is um, a Flask RESTful API server, which is um, sending out predictions um, based on Keras. The predictions, the Keras had built models and the models were, were built using data that we got from Yahoo. And um, uh, it, it shows the, um, predictions using JSON, which is not super pretty, but um, that's what you would expect from a Flask RESTful server. Yes? Yes? Okay, so the answer is how, how, how does, describe how the learning model, okay. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll start with a simple scenario. And the simple scenario is, um, does anyone remember the 10th of August of this month? I refer to it as uh, Nuclear Thursday. Okay, on Nuclear Thursday this month, um, the stock market went down a lot. Okay, now, so what my model, the way, the way my model would see that, it would say, oh, uh, I just saw a percent lag of 1.4%, okay? of down. So typically the way it responds to that is it is it starts issuing bullish predictions. Why? Because it's learned in the past whenever the stock market goes down 1.4 percent in the past, typically the next day is up. So it's naturally bullish. Uh, another thing it looks at is day of the week. Um, if you just go and do a simple uh, stati statistical analysis of days of the week, and match those up to percent leads, you'll see that some days are different than others. So that's, that goes into the model. Um, and then the next thing is sort of a discussion we started off with, and that is, well, Dan, what, what is your response variable? What is it that you're actually predicting? And what I'm predicting is the percent change over a one day duration. And that shows up in the software as a variable called percent underscore lead. Yes. Uh, the reason I, I don't do that is actually you do see me do it a little bit. If, if you closely look at how I create the date features, I get uh, integer for day of the week, which is one, two, three, four, five, and then an integer for a month, which is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 11, 12. What I do with those is I normalize those. I divide them by a number so that they are the same size as the other features that are going into the, the set. Now, some of those features are pretty similar in size. For example, percent lag one and percent lag two, they're more, they're basically the same range, okay? Now, percent lag eight might be a little bit bigger, but not much, okay? And the same goes for the slope. So if you look at, at the data in the features CSV, you'll see that most of the, uh, the magnitude of the values is basically the same across all the features. Now, if it weren't the same, then I would need to play this game of 
of normalizing them. Um, that is determined by the end user. So, for example, when when I uh, expose the API to an end user, you know, they can pick two years, they can pick 20 years, they can pick 30 years. So let's say that, like they're trying to predict Facebook and they pick 30 years. Well, we don't have 30 years of Facebook, so you would expect the server to, you know, issue some kind of a message saying that will not work. If, if the end user uh, wants to predict IBM and ask that it learn from 30 years, it'll work because we have IBM data going back to 1962. Yes. Uh, I disagree. I, um, the, the crux of the problem is teaching Python to uh, developers. And a good way to do that is with Pandas. And Pandas has some nice methods that allow you to do uh, lags and moving averages. However, um, a next good step would be, okay, well, what, what is it that people in finance do? Uh, they use things that are a little bit more sophisticated than the slope of a moving average. Like, for example, there's this thing called CCI, which is the, which CCI? It's Channel Commodity Indicator. And then there's RSI, and then, then you've got about, 17 different types of candlesticks. Um, so uh, yes, I could create more interesting features that would be more palatable to someone who's in finance, but I chose not to. I, it could be argued though that um, these features that I do use, they do, they might have some predictive power. Do, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Yes. money do I make? Um, <laughs> well, I will argue that if you're going to teach a Python class or machine learning class, real data packs a punch compared to studying something like whale songs or uh, how many people are riding bicycles in New York City. Uh, the, I don't know. Do you agree or? Do you... Yes. Somebody from audience or most of finance people asking, okay, so if you are so smart, how comes you're not rich? Yeah. I need to remember that one. <laughs> how are you deriving feature importance at Carousel? Uh, how am I derive? Okay, so it turns out um, some features might be more important than others, uh, obviously. And um, but I don't actually derive the importance. What I, I could, though, and a simple way to do that is uh, if I do have some code in this repository that uses um, sklearn linear regression. So you could run sklearn linear regression against these features, and you will get um, coefficients. And typically that's sort of the caveman way to look at what are the good features, is you just look at the coefficients that uh, sklearn kicks out when it runs linear regression against these. And what it likes is uh, percent lag one. Okay, and it considers percent lag one a better feature than percent lag eight. Um, and, uh, and then it likes, um, for slope of the moving average, I think it likes 
the, the shorter duration one. Yes. Yeah, that's what, creating money management and with machine learning. Yeah, I, so I think um, mixing money management with machine learning is sort of like a, a good next step. Right now, I'm just getting predictions. Yes? Have you used, uh, have you used Quantopian and have you compared your models with Quantopian? Yeah, okay, so here's, uh, yeah, I've bumped into Quantopian and um, there's some things about it I like. One thing, when I bumped into it about a year and a half ago, it was set up so that um, if I had a prediction, I had to wait one day before I could act on it. And to me, that felt wrong. I mean, I, I, you know, if the way my model works is I, I go and get a price five minutes before market close, and I said, that's the closing price. I turn a crank, I get a prediction, and then I act. Now, it turns out five minutes before market close is not the same as market close, but if you do a statistical analysis on the differences or that five minute period, you get a pretty uh, nice distribution that's symmetric. How far ahead are you in predicting? Uh, one day. One day? Yeah. 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 So when I say that, um, you might want to, what's your name? Dan. Dan. Oh, we got, it's Danville. Okay. Um, so feel free to see, because I just said that I made an assumption about what the prices do during the last five minutes, and he challenged it. You might want to, an interesting data science experiment would be to study what is the distribution of prices during the last five minutes. My assumption was that it's symmetric. Half of the time it goes up, half the time it goes down. Yeah, so it turns out if, if half the time, if like three quarters of the time it goes up, I smell money. Or three quarters of the time it goes down, I smell money. What might actually happen is what you see over a, a wider duration, like a day, and what you see is uh, a non-symmetric distribution where the negative tail is a little bit longer. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sure they would. I mean, they've got unlimited access to computing power. Uh, where is the mic? Oh, okay. Um, I think the meetup is starting to devolve. Um, <laughs> I like the questions. Um, that's true. Uh, okay. You see it in the README, so let's go take a look in the README. Um, so this is the problem with choosing a real-world problem, is that people might actually care about your, your problem. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Versus the population of herring in, in Norway for the last 300 years. Yeah. There's less interest there unless you have a bunch of chickens. Okay, so um, eventually you get to this place that I call learn and predict. Okay, um, so here's an example of what the predictions look like when you pull it directly out of Python. If you look at this, this is tabular formatted data, okay, that comes straight out of a pandas data frame. And you'll notice the middle column is called prediction. Okay, that's what comes out is, so, and if you look at these numbers, you'll notice that they all happen to be positive. So this is a series of 20 bullish predictions. Okay, the most positive one is on the 10th of August. Okay, does anyone remember 10th of August? It was Nuclear Thursday, okay. Okay, so um, that might kind of make sense why it was so bullish. And if you look to the right, you'll see that actually that was an accurate prediction. 
Well, it's accurate from the standpoint that it did accurately predict the sign of percent lead. It didn't, uh, these, I don't wanna try and predict what percent lead will be exactly, but I, if I can just figure out what the sign will be, that is enough information to get rich. Dan. Yes, you could. Um, so a, a good test would be to see how well it did in 2008 for like the S&P 500. Yeah. Well, I don't use this model to trade. I do use a model to make trading decisions. And uh, basically my trading style is I might flip from bearish to bullish and back again maybe five or six times a month. So it's not like high frequency trading. Basically I watch and uh, one thing that almost always happens is if we have something like Nuclear Thursday, I instantly go bullish. And then if it, if it tends to go up a lot, sooner or later I'll catch a bearish signal and then I'll go bearish. And when I go bearish, I go, um, um, I'm a little bit more aggressive. And the reason why is because if I lose an aggressive bearish bet, it's, I usually don't lose that much. On the other hand, if I lose an aggressive bullish bet, I can get nailed. But then, now we're kind of wandering into the world of trading away from machine learning. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't use this model, I use another one. And if, if you want to kind of see how it works, um, I can give you the URL. Uh, what does that prediction say? Like it says 0 0.131. What does that, what does that 131 represent? That basically, that's the most bullish prediction. So you look at these as relative numbers, and they're they're positive. Okay. So it's, it's not giving you necessarily a price entry point or any of that other stuff. It's just saying that stock's probably going to go up. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's actually kind of using regression as classification. Yeah. Um, yes. I just have one comment. Sure. Yes. Yes. The linear activation is just giving me a different Yeah. And and if I have a closed form solution, I should use it, which in case in this case I do, I have SK Learn. It's got, yeah, um, that's a good point. So uh, let's say like I didn't use linear, what should, what should I use instead? Like maybe ReLU or, okay, okay. Um, what time do, do we need to evaporate, Jeff? Time to go. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you for hey, well, coming. Thanks a lot, Dan, um, that's really yeah. interesting. So how much does the class where you teach us your real model, how much is that class? <laughs> so, anyway, thanks a lot and thanks to LinkedIn for hosting us. Yep, thank you.